I'm going to move him right along. Appreciate that message. And get. you may not believe this. I used to be a serious dancer until I got to, you know, when I met the Lord, I kind of quit some of it. I needed to. But uh, then my knees went out and it was over. But uh, I can dance just as hard as you by tapping my foot. <laughs> and if it's high level, I'll tap both of them. <laughs> I'm just saying. <clears throat> but I appreciate every kind of expression of worship. And it can be one of the most liberating things. But there's something more important than us being liberated. And that's God being touched. You know, now, I believe all of the worship that we do in services, conferences, whatever like that, it's not the main worship that we do. It's important, and I think it can be the highest level. I think it can be the incense that carries us into the glory of the Lord and there. But if we're not worshiping him day by day, you know, one of the scariest scriptures to me was when the Lord said through Isaiah, I despise your offerings. You know, so... Yeah, there are a lot of things we can do to express ourselves and all, but if we're not living for him, that's the true foundation of worship. And we're told that everything that we do, we're supposed to do as unto the Lord. I remember when I was a new Christian, brand new Christian, and learned that I've got to get a legal job. I've got to do something that's legal to make a living. So I thought, what can I do? And I said, Jesus was a carpenter. That's got to be the most awesome job you could ever do. So I went out and hired myself as a carpenter's helper. It was the worst job you could ever do. I mean, you cannot believe the drudgery. Uh, the heat, <laughs> the cold, the wet splinters in your hands, smashing your thumb with a hammer continually. <laughs> you know, they're just, I said, this is what Jesus did? But you know, there were four of us new Christians on this one construction crew. And one day we decided we're going to build these houses as if the Lord is going to live in them. Because he is. He said, as you do unto the least of my little ones, I'm going to count that as doing it unto me. So we decide we're going to turn our carpentry into worship. We're going to do it with all of our heart as unto the Lord. We're going to build the best houses that ever been built. Martin Luther King Jr. said one time, if you sweep streets, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted. And if you do that, sooner or later, the whole world will beat a path to your door and say, here lives the best street sweeper there ever was. Everything we do is supposed to be done as unto the Lord. And that's the foundation of a true Christian life. And uh, anyway, we turn what had been drudgery into something I love so much, I didn't want to see five o'clock come around. I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to quit. I'd go home and daydream about working the next day. That's how much I started loving carpentry. And uh, it had turned into drudgery. I mean, turned drudgery into something glorious, something edifying, fulfilling. Every day I could see what I'd done, what I built. And I did it unto the Lord. I knew I did the best I could. And every day we said, we're going to do it better. Later when I flew airplanes, I try to do the same thing. Every time I fly this plane, I'm going to fly it better than I did the last time. I was taught that by a man who I worked for for a while, who was considered perhaps the best pilot in the world. He's trained fighter pilots from around the world, trained as Israel's pilots. And, uh, but anyway, there's something that we do where it's a life of worship. 
Now, one time Ricky Skaggs asked me to go with him to pray for Bill Monroe, who was in a hospital. And uh, he was dying. You know, Bill Monroe, some of you don't know, he was considered the father of bluegrass music. And he had a, you know, most, I think a third of his songs or so were about the Lord. He was a Christian. He tried to live a good life, but he had a rough time at it. Anyway, I went with Ricky up to see him in the hospital, and we walked into the room, and I started to back out. I was shocked at the anointing I ran into. I said, Lord, what is this? And I pulled Ricky aside, and I said, Ricky, we need to get him to pray for us. I said, what is this? So when I went home, I really sought the Lord, and that's when he showed me. He said, what he had was creativity. And that's something that touches the heart of the creator, I think, more than just about anything else we can do. You know, that is the one common denominator you find in Hebrews 11. All of those who became the great heroes of the faith, the only thing, and some of the things they did that qualified them to be listed there in the great hall of the heroes of the faith was they did something that had never been done before. <clears throat> I think that takes, takes a faith that pleases God, we know is required to please God, but it may take an ultimate faith to go beyond the present limits, to do something truly creative that has never been done. It could be dancing like nobody's ever done it before. I don't know. I think some of you do that every time you get up. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> and I would be a bigger mess if I were trying to do it. I think some of it can come from those who just can't get up or, or that's not their thing. I understand the word for worship, halal, and all that. And I think it is. But we need to understand the creator, how he made every one of us different. He made every snowflake different. He makes every person different. And we need to allow for that creativity. You know, you can be a worship leader or a cheerleader. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. There's something when it's really worship unto the Lord that is pleasing to him, it's going to be anointed. It's going to, he, uh, you know, he inhabits the praises of his people. You're going to have the presence of the Lord and everybody's going to want to worship in their way. But you know, you can touch his heart more if you're not feeling it. If you're not feeling it, but you're still doing it. Now, I learned that the hard way, really hard way, that uh, I was one time so sick, I couldn't get out of bed. And I was by myself at our house on the coast. And, uh, but I laid there, I couldn't even hardly think I felt so bad. And I was uh, there alone, but I, I try every day, there's certain things that I do that, you know, scripture says brings pleasure to the Lord, brings delight to the Lord, and I do them. And I tried my best, and I said, Lord, this is the most feeble attempt I know I've ever made it trying to do this, but this is the best I can do today. Unless you heal me, this is the best I can do. Well, I woke up next morning totally healed. And I got in my car, we had, were having a seminar in Moravian Falls, and I drove to Moravian Falls, and I got there and was going to lay down, take a nap, and I slept for eight hours, earth time. I've never done that. I was in heaven for eight hours. I laid down, went to sleep, went straight to heaven. And I've had experiences in the heavenly realm many times, and everyone's different. I believe heaven is more diverse than the earth. The geography of heaven is far more diverse. The species in heaven, I mean, we get a hint of it in scripture. Cherubim, angels, all kinds of different beings. <laughs> the species, the spiritual species in heaven is far more diverse 
than what is on the earth. We know the whole physical realm, the whole physical universe, just a shadow of the heavenly realm. But anyway, this was the best part of heaven I had ever been to. And I've been to some great parts of heaven. And this, but this was by far the best. And then right at the end of this experience, the Lord said, you know how you got here? I said, Lord, I didn't know I did anything to get here. He said, yes, you used the key to eternal joy. I said, Lord, I don't even remember any key. I don't. He said that when I was feeling that bad, I took my attention off of myself and said, I am going to do the things that bring delight to the Lord. He said, you use the key of eternal joy. And that's why you're here. And uh, now, doesn't it say it's the joy of the Lord that is our strength? Not our joy. His joy. I remember one time in another experience where I had a vision of this dry as dust little country church trying to sing to the Lord and it was not pretty. You know, it wasn't on key, it wasn't and I know how to sing off key, but they were perfect they had perfected that. <laughs> you know, but uh <clears throat> they were <laughs> it was like the worst sounding thing you could imagine. And all of a sudden, I'm in the throne room and the Lord silenced heaven to listen to that little church. He wanted heaven to hear them because he knew all the trials. He knew the hard lives that they had, the trials every one of them was experiencing. Yet here they were, taking their attention completely off themselves and the best they could, and it wasn't pretty, the best they could, they were trying to show their adoration and love for God. And to him, that meant more than all the glorious choirs of heaven. He silenced them to hear that. <clears throat> here on this earth, when you're going through the, even when you're going through, especially when you're going through the worst trials of your life, do not waste that trial. Worship. And we start with the foundation of worship. Now, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Okay, why do we worship? Why do we have warfare? How do they connect? Psalm 149.6 says, let the high praise of God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand. These two go together. They are connected. And there are many people think, I'm going to do one or the other. You're not going to do one or the other very well unless you're doing, doing them both. And worship is warfare and warfare is worship of a different form. Okay. King David, one of the greatest worshipers, perhaps the greatest worshiper in the Old Testament, was also one of the greatest warriors. Okay? So we see these contrasting nature, natures, both being a worshiper and a warfare, in the greatest leaders. Here's how we start this is the foundation enter his gates with thanksgiving. It's courts with praise. We start by being a thankful person, not a grumbling, complaining person. You know, the grumblers and complainers, he would not let into the promised land. He said he would not let them enter because of their grumbling and complaining. If we really saw the opportunity that every trial we're going through is to bring pleasure to the Lord, when we take our attention off of ourselves and focus on Him, we would not continue to waste those opportunities. 
Doesn't it say in 1 Thessalonians 5, in everything give thanks. That means trials too. They're the especially best times to worship. He says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If we really believe him, really believe his word, that all things work for good, that it's impossible for the devil to get a shot in while God isn't looking. So whatever's happening in our life, it may not be the Lord doing it, but he has allowed it for a reason. And it's going to be for our good. Do we really believe that? Then how can we not thank him for everything? And I understand some things it is really hard to thank him for. But if we will do it, <laughs> not only do we get transformed, more important than us getting transformed and what we get out of this, true worship touches him. And we were created for that purpose. We were created for his pleasure, not our pleasure. We learn to bring him pleasure, you're going to have more pleasure than you ever would have otherwise. You seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. You lose your life for his sake, you'll find it. But, now, you know, there are a lot of Christians today subject to panic attacks, depression. I understand they, we've got a lot of physical reasons for depression, chemical imbalances and things like that. But I just ask you to question, maybe we, those who have those chemical imbalances, wouldn't have them if they would worship. If they were aligned with God, which is what worship does. And I'm talking about the full worship. Everything that we do, we do un, as unto the Lord. If we wash dishes, we wash dishes as if Jesus is going to eat off those dishes because he is. He says, you do unto the least of these little ones, you're doing it to me. And if we would do that, I think a lot of this stuff would go away. But doesn't it say in Psalm 1611, in his presence is the fullness of joy. You cannot be depressed and have the fullness of joy at the same time. And if we're in his presence, we're going to have the fullness of joy. So if we're starting to get depressed, the reason is we have drifted from his presence. The answer to that depression is get back in his presence. What are we doing that have separated us? He doesn't move. He never leaves us or forsakes us. The separation is never on his part. But we have choice. We can choose. We see in Revelation 3.20, Jesus himself even standing outside the door of his own church to see if anyone would open for him. In this age, you've got to want him. Do you want him at your job? Are you, is it depressing to go to work? <laughs> I see a lot of no's. I see a few no's. I see a few. It's really depressing. <laughs> you know, I hate my job. I hated carpentry. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay there. You can turn to worship and it can be glorious and you'll bring the presence of the Lord there. There's going to be joy in your work. You're not going to be able to wait to get there on Monday morning. Wouldn't, you know, you can get a whole lot more excited about Monday morning than Sunday morning. You know, we walk with him in our garden, wherever he's placed us. Every one of us has been given a garden, a spiritual domain that we're called to walk with God in bear fruit in, to cultivate, to bear fruit in, and to take authority over, to take dominion over. And I take that as wherever he has us. Wherever you work, that's supposed to be a part of your garden. Your neighborhood is supposed to be a part of your garden that you're taking responsibility for. I'm just saying that's another old teaching. But... It's the joy of the Lord, and that comes from his presence. 
You know, he's always with us, but there is a difference and there's a difference in scripture in the presence of the Lord and the manifest presence where he is manifest. You know, we've had times when people came to our building, it happened a few times that I was there at Presley Road, our other place where people would come in, delivery people, Federal Express people would come in and just be stunned. Like, what is that I feel in this building? We've had that a few times here. But you know, the Lord doesn't inhabit buildings anymore. It's his people. Okay? Now, I'm just throwing this in. It does connect. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Okay, we're warriors. How do we pursue peace with everybody? Warriors do it better than anybody else. I tell you, the people who hate war more than anyone else are those who have to fight them. They do it, often gifted to do it. There are not many that are really gifted warriors, but you can still be a good soldier. But there, even the military, they'll teach you, there are many soldiers, but not many warriors. Warriors thrive in warfare. They live for warfare. They may hate it at the same time. Doesn't mean they like it, but they're made for it and they thrive in it and they're good at it. You know, one of our board members, one of the founding members of Delta Force and led the Delta Force, some of its biggest battles. I asked him one time, we had eight hours in the car together one time driving somewhere. I said, okay, Jerry, tell me about all of your battles. I want to hear about all of them. He said, I can't even remember all of them. He had no idea how many battles, physical firefights and everything else he had been in. I knew a lot of the guys that had, you know, been under him in Delta. They still have get togethers, still good friends and everything. These are warriors, but they're some of the most gentle, kind uh, people. But there is something about how do... What would happen if we looked at those who are the most opposed to the things of God and to who we are and would seek peace with them? What would that look like? I'm just saying, don't have time to go there. But that's a part of it. And then he says the sanctification. We cannot, we can dance around all we want, sing beauty like the canaries and everything else on Sunday. Trust me, the Lord's not going to receive that if we're living in hell the other six days of the week. It's our life that counts. You know, his disciples, he called them to take up their crosses daily. It's a life of sacrifice. What does that look like? And we know there's a time for peace and a time for war. If we're pursuing peace and a time for war... We're deceived. We are deceived. If we're pursuing war when it's a time for peace, we are deceived. We need to know the times and know what we should do. But it's a whole lot of it is a matter of timing. And there are many different kinds of warfare. And we're talking mostly about spiritual warfare in this. But I believe we have the high praise of God in our mouth at the same time we have that sword ready. Guess what? We've all been dropped behind enemy lines. The whole world dwells in the power of the evil one. Now, there's a difference between power and authority. He doesn't have the authority to be doing what he's doing, but he has the power now until the Lord takes it away from him. But he let him loose for our sake. He could have bound Satan after he was resurrected. He could have done away with all the demons, all the evil on earth right after his resurrection. He left them for our sake. We get to do this. There's nowhere else that this can be proven what we're made of and what our true devotion is, what our true heart is like warfare. And it needs to be worship where we're not just doing it for ourselves. It's a noble thing to want to fight for your country and fight for your family, everything else. 
we have a higher purpose than any of those things. We're fighting the good fight of faith. Okay. So I believe we're entering a time of increasing warfare, increasing conflict. If we don't know how to fight and you say, I'm not going to fight, you're going to be a casualty. You may already be one. Uh, and it's not necessary. I've seen the army of the Lord and how few of God's people have actually put their armor on. And how wounded they are, how weak they are, because they didn't think they needed to fight. They just need to worship. Well, <clears throat> we're going to see a big difference coming up, but I believe we're going to see a lot of people waking up saying, no, it's both. It really is both. And we do whatever warfare we're called to as worship unto the Lord. Standing for him, standing for his truth. Standing for his gospel. Okay? Abraham's called the father of faith. He's called that in the Old and New Testaments. Old and New Covenants. He's the father of the New Covenant too. He was pre-Old Covenant. They didn't have the law when Abraham was called. And we see Abraham, his life is defined by encounters with the Lord. Each one changed him and gave him more clarity about his purpose. Now, I believe this is normal Christianity. I believe this, our lives should be marked by encounters with him. Now, we don't necessarily live just for them. They can be rare. And I heard one pastor say one time, he said, you know, my wife only cooked about five meals that were so outstanding, I can remember them in detail to this day. She's cooked me thousands of meals, but there's only been about five on that level. But I needed all of those others to stay alive. <laughs> you know, so <clears throat> we need to appreciate the great encounters and we seek them. We've had some wonderful ones here. We want more, but you know, the Lord will bless many things he will not inhabit. He will visit things he will not inhabit. Very first question, the first two disciples who followed him, and listen, there are not many Christians who are disciples. It's a big difference. The Lord gave a definition of a disciple, of his disciples, I think you go through what he said his disciples were, you'll say, I may not even know one. That's okay. You can still be saved. You know, the multitudes followed him. They believed in him. That's why they were following him. There's certain definite benefit from that. But there were only a few that were called to be disciples. And he called them. They didn't choose him. He chose them. I'm just saying, and it's a whole different life. And that's what the Great Commission is, making disciples, not just converts. I'm just saying. But Abraham, and I think us, we can be defined by our encounters. They can give us clarity, direction, purpose, focus. But after each encounter, he built an altar. I just ask you to consider we should do the same thing. Not to worship the encounter, but to acknowledge this is God. Our pursuit is to be his habitation. Not just someplace that he visits every now and then. Those are spectacular. I want more of them. But I tell you how much better to be the dwelling place of God. Isn't that what the first two disciples who followed him asked? When he asked them, why are you following me? We need to be asked the same question. Why are we doing this? Yes, most people today, they'll list one of the blessings or maybe many of the blessings. 
They talk about the blessings. Most of the focus of like 90 plus percent of the sermons you hear are about the blessings. I want more blessings too. I don't, you know, that's not a bad thing, but it also shows our immaturity when that is the main focus. We want to be his dwelling place. What does that mean? Discipleship is a life of sacrifice. Daily. Taking up your cross every day. What does that mean? I believe if you're called as a disciple, there will be provided for you every day a chance to lay down your life for his purposes. Maybe a big thing, maybe a small thing, but you will be given the opportunity to die to self, to be alive to him every day. How many of us don't even see him? Don't even recognize because we're not oriented towards taking up our cross. We're not living that. Well, I tell you, we're going to need to. Remember how David brought the ark into Zion? I remember years ago when we started doing conferences. There were a few things the Lord showed us about the conferences. He gave me a vision for the purpose of conferences. One thing he said, they're going to be like the feast of Israel where people from all the different tribes gathered in one place. And he said if they had not done that several times a year, they would have lost their identity as being one nation. They would have just gravitate towards their own tribal. Each tribe had its own vision, its own purpose, calling, prophecies, all of that. But they needed to stay in touch with how they were one nation. We're one nation under God. I don't care what denomination you're in, what movement you're in, anything. We're all one nation under God. He said he was going to use conferences in our time for that same thing. I tell you, we've had 65 nations represented in a single conference. We may have had more, but the one time we really counted how many different nations, there were 65. And many more denominations. And wouldn't it when the People from all nations gathered that he poured out his Holy Spirit. There's something about bringing together the diversity where we can come together and worship him and not try to make the person next to us like us, but recognize and honor the way they are. Maybe the way they worship that is different from us. I tell you, beware of the pressure to conform. That is what must basically compromises our freedom in the spirit. The pressure to conform. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But how did David bring in the ark? Remember at first they tried this new ox cart. This new thing, this new song, this new way of doing it is going to bring the glory in. Well, how did that work for him? The Lord struck one of them dead for their presumption. They had the presumption. He put out his hand, thinking he could in his own strength steady the glory of God. And he might have thought, and everybody might have thought, that's a noble thing to do. Didn't work too well. They parked the ark at Obed-Edom's house. <laughs> We've got to find out how the Lord wants to be brought in. They went and sought the Lord for the way he wanted to be brought in. And then when David went and got the ark at Obed-Edom's house, who was getting blessed immeasurably by the presence of the Lord, he said, we've got to have the ark with us in Jerusalem. We've got to have the ark. What good is all this if the Lord's not with us? What good is the most glorious temple if there's no God in it? What is this we're building? So, he goes back. Now, at, I remember when, one time when Barry Siegel, you may know Barry has great ministry in Israel. This was years ago, like 1990 or something like that. We're sitting on my porch up in Moravian Falls. And Barry actually lived where the Obed-Edom's house was in Israel at the time. So we tried to compute how far it was from his house to Mount Zion. 
We came up, we blew, estimated, wild estimate, but between 11 and 14 kilometers, we broke that down into steps. And remember, doesn't it say that when David went to get the ark, they went six steps and then offered an ox and a fatling. We estimated he stopped 3,600 times to sacrifice, going, bringing the ark into Jerusalem. Can you imagine the trail of blood and guts? Now you know why David danced so hard when he got there. And that's what he said. He said each one of our conferences would be a step for us. Some little, some bigger. We would keep moving up. It'd be an ever increasing going up. We've done actually right now several, I can't remember the last count, this was years ago, of the number of conferences we'd hosted was like 285. I don't know where it is now. That was years ago. It's what we do. It's part of our calling and ministry to gather people from different movements and all together. And one of the main reasons you're here is not for us or not to hear what you hear from us. It's to meet somebody. Divine connections. That's one of the main anointings on this property that God placed here. Divine encounters. Barnabas had to go and get Paul before either one of them could get promoted into their ultimate purpose. There are divine connections we have to have to go higher. Okay? So anyway, so we're plodding along. And listen, we, we have, love conferences, love, dance, you know, all the music and the worship and the incredible people we've had and messages preached. You know, it's one of the best jobs you could ever have. I've wondered at times if we would get penalized in heaven because we have it so good here. But it is sacrifice. You wouldn't believe the work. You wouldn't believe the warfare that goes on before every conference. And if it's a really good one after every conference, we're going to have to fight for our lives. It's worth it. It's what we do. Okay? Now, I'm just trying to throw some big concepts. Hopefully, if these are seeds the Lord's sowing, he'll water them. A while back, the Lord showed me we're going to understand and see the release of a spiritual E equal MC squared. Get ready for power. Power to be released on a level we have not even. I've got a pretty big imagination. Hollywood's got a big imagination. I was, when I was being provoked of all this stuff that was being put out, you know, and like the X-Men and all this that I thought was leading people to be, to maybe the wrong supernatural and all this, the Lord corrected me. He said, no, let Hollywood go wild with their imagination. And then I'm going to do what trumps their biggest imagination. No pun intended. <laughs> but get ready for power like they have any, all their wild imaginations not going to equal. Lord showed me decades ago some of the greater works and how to do them in a dream. And he said his people, he was going to have people in these times who were going to speak to mountains and they would be plucked up and cast into the sea. He said, this will be literal. It has to be to prove his word is true. And one little thing he showed me about how we would do them. He said, Peter did not walk on the water. He said, he walked on my word. He said, when I said, come, he said, my word has more substance than the firmament. It's obedience. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. We have our vision of this. One reason we have such a focus on the prophetic and seeing and seeing what God is saying, seeing what God is doing. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. He could have healed everybody at the pool of Siloam. He probably tipped over some of the worst 
cases you could imagine, he only healed one. He could have healed them all. But there's that level of obedience required for those who are going to walk in these things. That can only come from a life of taking up our cross, seeking to hear him. Okay, equal MC square. E is for energy, M is for mass, C is for speed of light squared. Now what this equation is, according to the you know, Big Bang theory, and it is still a theory, there's been a huge amount of evidence proving that everything that came into being came into being in one nanosecond, one millisecond. All of the mass and all of the energy in the universe today came at one second. And the universe is expanding at a pretty good rate. There's a lot of things that has to prove, that's what proved to Einstein that there had to be a creator. He had believed that the universe was static and that's why his first theory of relativity was wrong. And it was foolishly wrong. One of his equations required you to divide by zero. What can you divide by zero? That, every fourth grader knows that. Can't do that. But he did because that was the only way it would work with what he believed was a static universe. When Hubble, the man the Hubble telescope was named after, who at that time had the biggest telescope in the world, in California, he saw the red shift. Now, this physics lesson and astronomy lesson is free. You're not paying anything for this. Okay, but when he saw the red shift, he knew the universe is expanding. Because when something's moving away from you, the light that you see will have a red tint to it because the light waves are being stretched out and that gets into the ultra red, ultraviolet, whatever, but it, it will be, appear like a red shift. If something's coming to you, it will appear blue or purple. Okay, I'm just saying. Well, as soon as Hubble saw that everywhere, the whole universe, there's a red shift. Everything's moving away. When Einstein heard that, he went out to Hubble's telescope himself to see it. He didn't believe it. But as soon as he saw it, he said, there's a creator. He was an atheist up until that time. He said, somebody did this. Because if it's expanding like that, there had to be a single point beginning. And for that to happen, somebody had to do it. Of course, we have now the second law of thermodynamics you know, the first law of thermodynamics, the, the law of the conservation of energy, all of the energy in the universe today was there at the very beginning. Has not increased or decreased. Still there. It can change forms, but it cannot be destroyed. You can turn it, fire into heat and whatever. There's ways that it can change forms. But Einstein, what he came up with was energy can be converted to mass and mass can be converted to energy. This is what set off the first atomic bomb, which proved this. You know how much mass they converted to energy to set off that bomb? Six tenths of a gram. I mean, like a crumb. Look how much energy came out. Now, I'm just saying, there is energy, more than enough energy in God's creation to last for as long until the earth wears out and the sun dies and all that. <laughs> we got plenty of energy. We're not going to use up all of our energy. It's just learning how to do it. You know, it was always there and available. We just didn't know how to tap it. You know, electricity was always existed. We just didn't know how to use it. I still don't know a whole lot about electricity, but I know how to turn the switch on. That's all I need to know. Somebody else knows all the other stuff. Do you understand what I'm saying? How we have tapped in to how to convert a tiny, 
tiny amount of mass to energy and look at the amount of energy that comes from it. Lord said, we're going to see that in the spirit. But the way the conversion happens, it's going to be taking up our cross. The cross is what releases the power of God. The cross is the power of God. He said, when you convert your lust into love, there's going to be an unbelievable amount of mass. I mean, energy released by that. Spiritual energy, spiritual power. You take everything. Listen, this is not just so that we get perfected. It's way bigger than that. We've got to get our focus off of ourselves if we're going to walk in almost anything of him. It's about seeing his purpose released, seeing his power released. Listen, I was shown little children laying hands on hospitals and everybody in the hospital getting healed immediately. Nobody knew how it happened. It's just all of a sudden everybody's well and they walk out. That's a small thing for God. When Moses parted the Red Sea, the angels were bored. They had seen the heavens stretched out like a tent curtain. You remember the Hubble, the deep field, first picture taken by the Hubble when they got it fixed? It's called the most important image ever taken. They pointed the Hubble telescope when they finally got it fixed at what they thought was empty space. They're going to take a picture of empty space first. Came back, there were over 2,000 galaxies in that picture, each with about 200 billion stars in them, each galaxy. You count the number of those stars. And they thought it was empty space. They said they took a picture of about a square inch of space. It wasn't that much. They said it was more like a grain of sand. If you could imagine holding up a grain of sand, taking a picture through that, they thought this is empty and it was so full they couldn't believe it. Instantly, our knowledge of the universe <laughs> exploded. I wish that we could spend a lot more time on this, but, but I want to move on to something more important. But we do have the first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of energy. Second law, law of entropy which basically utterly disproves the theory of evolution that is still a theory, never been proven. Not even some of the most basic aspects have ever been proven. And to be considered a law of physics, there has to be no example, not even a single example of an exception to that law. Okay? Basic law... Second law of thermodynamics, also called the law of entropy, is that the whole universe is moving towards chaos, not synthesis. When two things collide, it doesn't relieve. You know, a tornado cannot hit a junkyard and leave behind a perfectly built home. <laughs> you know, I mean, it doesn't work that way. And everything in the universe is moving towards chaos unless acted upon by an outside intelligent source. Your house, you may have built it, may be a great house, but it will deteriorate if you don't maintain it. Wherever there's no outside intelligent source, it's going to deteriorate, it's moving towards chaos. Don't change the oil in your car and it's going to break down stuff, bad stuff's going to happen. You've got to be intelligent about maintaining your... The whole universe is that way. God created it that way. So that I've asked some of the top physicists on the planet at this time and they all agreed, proves God. It, not necessarily a God. They said proves a creator. It could have been some space alien. <laughs> I mean, they'll come up with anything to keep from believing in God. But they said there was definitely a creator, no question. This could not have happened. There's no way <laughs> the intricacy of our DNA could have happened by random chance. And it would take thousands upon thousands of perfectly timed random accidents to form a single cell of our DNA. 
the DNA in a single cell. Can't happen. They said, oh, we well, even put all the computers on the earth combined. Couldn't even compute the odds of one of them happening. I'm just saying, just moving along, okay? You guys have that. I want to talk just a minute now. I'm moving along about the number one enemy we've got to wage war with. It's the same one, the Lord, the warred against the Lord, and he warred against when he walked the earth. You know, the demons were no problem for the Lord. They would come bow the knee to him. By the way, we got a recovered deliverance in the church. I think demons have been having babies. They're multiplying. You know, they're, we got to go back to this. And one basic principle of deliverance, you really need to understand, if you do not pay your exorcist, you may get repossessed. I'm just saying. But <clears throat> worse than the demons, more deadly than the demons, the religious spirit. Right now, I can tell you this, it's a fact, the religious spirit has more power and more influence in the church than the Holy Spirit does. Does not have more authority, but more power and influence. Number one thing, perverting worship, is this religious spirit. Okay? I believe it's the primary stronghold. We've got a war against, we've got to understand. But basically, a religious spirit, it's an evil spirit, a counterfeit spirit, that seeks to have us base our relationship to God on our own religious performance rather than acceptance with God because of the cross. We don't serve him in order to gain his approval. We already have his approval through the cross. We serve him because it's the right thing to do, because we love him. We want to obey him, not for what we get, not seeking our own approval, okay? And uh, I believe the Antichrist spirit is the religious spirit. It's personification, main personification of the religious spirit, and it takes its seat in the temple of God, which is not some building built in the Middle East. We're the temple of God now. You know, I've studied the early church fathers, every one, there are many of them concerned considered early church fathers, but I've studied many of them. You know, not a single one foresaw a temple, a physical temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem. Not a single one. Every one of them, when they were discussed, John, the revelation of John and all this, and the uh, Son of Man as revealed through Daniel and Revelation and other places, the man of sin, they saw it as something coming into the church, which is now the temple of God. I'm just saying. And I think we, we need to get this, but there are a number of inroads used by the religious spirit, but we are basically born with the religious spirit when we're born in sin. It's the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know, the good side of that tree is just as deadly as the evil side. Human goodness is just as deadly as human evil because it's usually used to supplant the cross as a basis for our righteousness and standing with God or with people or anything else where we're a good person. Or whatever. It's just as deadly. You're going to die just as much if you follow that. We see here in 1 Thessalonians, you can read it. He says, let no one in any way deceive you. For it, the coming of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he even takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. I'm just saying, that's us. It's the way virtually every one of the reformers understood the man of sin. 
This has come in the church. Okay? Talks about another place, those who hold to a form of godliness, although they, though they denied its power, we're told to avoid such men as these. Not, not sit under their teaching, not join their congregations, whatever. But uh, I believe even the best churches on, laid on the best foundation will have a continuous attempt of the religious spirit to gain entry, to supplant Christ as the head of that church. I'm just saying, Jesus, find one thing in the Gospels Jesus said or did that was not opposed, that was not criticized, that he was not threatened over. Find one thing. I can't find a single thing. We're, we should expect this. We, we should not be concerned when people attack us. We should get excited and rejoice. Isn't that what he told us to do when we were persecuted? Blessed are you. Do we believe Jesus? Comes with the territory. If you're not taking flack, you're not over the target. John Wesley, once, he went three days when nobody tried to stone him. People were trying, throwing rocks at him all the time. He went three days when no one tried to stone him he went off into the woods to fast and pray. He thought he had backslidden. There's something wrong with him that people weren't attacking him. You live godly in Christ Jesus, not in this perception of godliness that is a religious spirit's conception. You live godly in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted because this world is filled with a religious spirit and atheists have some of the biggest religious spirits of all. I'm just saying, remember in the South, you can say almost anything and get away with it if you just finish with, I'm just saying. <laughs> if you got to say something bad about somebody, you can get away with that too, as long as you finish with the book, bless their hearts. <laughs> you know, you can, so that's how we get away with it. <clears throat> the religious spirit is the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Lord warned us about. And you know, there's a ditch on either side of the path of life. Legalism on one side, lawlessness on the other. You know, leaven, two things are called leaven in scripture and they're counter opposites. Legalism is called leaven. When he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, he's talking about their legalism. Then Paul writes in Corinthians about the, the uh, lawlessness you know, corruption being leaven. Sin and wickedness, he called it, is leaven. So we have lawlessness on one side, legalism on the other. And usually, if you fall in a ditch on one side, you'll overreact and then fall in the ditch on the other side. We've got to learn to stay on the path of life between the ditches. It's neither one of these. Okay? Leaven is defined... Now, I understand Webster... Is not considered a theological thing, but he was one of the most godly men our nation's ever produced. And uh, I, I think he came up with some great definitions that really are, bring clarity to the word of God. But anyway, he called leaven a substance such as yeast, which causes fermentation, causing bread to rise or expand. And if you look up the word ferment, it says to cause agitation, disturbance, unrest. That's the foundation of a religious spirit, foundational fruit of a religious spirit. You can never measure up. You can never satisfy a religious spirit. So you're always disturbed, always trying in your own strength, your own works. So, okay. So this is a constant battle. We need to understand it. We don't want to promote legalism or lawlessness. Now, I have to admit, I probably enjoy insulting people with a religious spirit. 
Uh, we do things to purposely do that. I, I probably need to repent of a lot of that. But uh, I think there's something where we absolutely got to be free of caring about what religious people think. Paul said, if I were still seeking to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. One of the main things we've got to do is get delivered from the fear of man and concern what people think, any people think, especially religious people. And I tell you, Christian Pharisees are even more Pharisaical than the ones that Jesus faced in some cases. We got multitudes of Christian Pharisees. Don't care about what they think. Uh, we want to know we're pleasing the Lord. It's a constant battle, but we have to be delivered from the fear of man. Okay? What were the results of eating of the tree of knowledge? First thing, self-centeredness. Looked at themselves, saw they were naked. We got to de get delivered of this. This is the main thing, dogging pe God's people and keeping them infants in Christ. Where we're constantly measuring ourselves even against the word of God and everything else. No, Christ is our righteousness. If you start walking in a gift or ministry, you start walking in prophecy, you will hear the devil say, who do you think you are, Isaiah? You know what you need to reply? I'm going higher than that. And you think that's pride. Well, it can be. And there's almost certainly some pride mixed in. You know, we're not going to do this perfectly. There's only one who's going to walk this earth perfectly. He's already done it. We're not going to have perfect motives. And if you're waiting to have perfect motives to do anything, you're never going to do anything. I remember the first time I went to a Pentecostal camp in Ashland, Virginia, just north of Richmond. You know, there was a real great lady that came out of that camp. But I was a brand new Christian. I'd known the Lord just a few weeks. Someone took me to that camp. And this is the first, I'd never heard of holy rollers. These were holy rollers. They were rolling down the aisles. And I'm sitting there going, I was criticizing, judging. I am going, that's just the flesh. That's just the flesh. Look at all that carn out there. That's not the spirit, that's the flesh. You know what the Lord said to me? He agreed with me. He said, you're right. But I wish your flesh would worship me rather than what it normally does. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I took it as a rebuke. <laughs> I said, okay, where can I roll? <laughs> you know, you've all heard people pray in a religious spirit. They're not praying to God. They're praying to you. They're preaching to you. They're trying to convict you to see things. You, you know that kind of... I know a lot of people quit praying because of that. No, you don't quit praying. You do it in the right spirit. Prayer is crucial. It's one of the things that brings God delight. Everything can be done in a religious spirit. Everything. Well, don't let that turn you off so you don't do it. Just do it in the right spirit. All right, self-centeredness. First thing, they looked at themselves. Second thing, they tried to hide from God. And I don't think you're going to be able to do that. Then they tried to cover their own sin, provide for their own righteousness, and then they start blame shifting. Not my fault, it was this other person. Always making excuses. Someone once said, he is good at making excuses, is seldom good at anything else. I tell you what we got to do. I believe, this is my belief, and it's not scripture. I wouldn't make a doctrine out of this, but it is my belief that if instead of trying to hide from God and do all this, they had run to God, said, we made a mistake. We would have still needed the atonement. We would have still needed all that, but it would not have been as bad. The evil released in the world and everything else would not have been as bad. My point is, if when you sin, and it's going to happen, we all stumble in many ways. We all trip up. Even the righteous says, fall seven times, but they keep getting back up. 
if we would learn to run to God instead of away from him and try to hide from him and provide our own righteousness, whatever, make up for our sin. All you're doing by all these things are gates of hell through which the religious spirit enters. All of them. Especially self-centeredness. We're called to be Christ-centered. You're not going to get changed by seeing how bad you are. You can be changed by seeing the glory of the Lord. We've got to look to him in his glory. But we need to acknowledge. We need to repent. When we sin, we need to acknowledge it. Okay? I'm moving right along because there's a whole lot to this. By by the way, I've got a little booklet in the bookstore on the religious spirit that covers most of this. If you want to dig deeper... Uh, there is so much to it. It's almost an endless study. But when you get the foundations, you start to recognize it. How it's always trying to supplant Christ in our life, the Holy Spirit in our life, to supplant God. It's an anti-Christ spirit. But that doesn't mean so much they're going to come out clearly against the Lord. They're going to try to supplant him, to be a substitute for him. It's selfishness, self-centeredness. It leads to that, builds on that. Okay, some of the most deceptive traits of religious spirit are founded upon zeal for God. Some of the most zealous for the Lord are motivated by by religious spirit. But (laughs) zeal is good. How was... What was the repentance for the Laodicean lukewarm spirit? Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Zeal's good. Okay? But you can be really motivated by religious spirit to be zealous. Paul wrote in Romans 10, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge, not in accordance with the truth. No one on earth prayed more, fasted more, read the Bible more, had a greater hope in the coming Messiah than those who opposed him the most when he came. The Pharisees. The religious pride had them convinced that the Messiah was going to come as a Pharisee. As one of them. Now, just hear me on this. Sooner or later, you're going to understand this, I believe. Any faith, any doctrine that gets institutionalized, gets corrupted, and will become based more on the works of men than God. What were we told in Hebrews? Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. We've got to learn. We've got to go outside the camp. Jesus never became a part of the camp. Neither did the the apostles, disciples who became apostles or anything else. They never became a part of the camp. We've got to understand what institutionalizing faith does to faith. I'm just saying. In scripture, it's called Mystery Babylon, which is the counterfeit church. Can't dig down into that, but I'm... Uh, institutions are focused on the temporal, becoming substitutes for what God is doing. What was we're called to do? Keep our eyes on what God is building, his city. That was the faith of Abraham. He was seeking to be a part of what God was building, not men. So he would, you know, he could, one of the startling things said about the patriarchs was they lived in tents. They were some of the wealthiest men. They made kings jealous with their wealth. They could have built some of the most beautiful palaces in the world at that time. They were not interested. 
because they, they were not focused on the temporal. They had seen God's city. They were, everything they were doing was to prepare to be a part of what God was building, not what was built on this temporary dwelling here. We've got to get delivered of that if we're going to be a part of his city. Jesus had little trouble with demons. It's the conservative religious community that was his greatest enemy and had him crucified. Now, why are they so zealous? You know, <clears throat> one thing too, don't be worried about false prophets. I say, you know, they're easy to discern. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned or whatever. We're not supposed to worry about anything. We're told to be anxious for nothing. Fear opens a door to wrong perception, to wrong discernment. Okay, but it's easy to recognize a cult, a false prophet, all these things. It's the false brethren that are doing all the damage. It's the pseudo prophets who are real Christians, but have presumed a position that God did not appoint them to. God did not call them to. They were called by men. They can, you can receive all kinds of prophecies from men until you get it from God, he's not obligated to keep it. And if you wonder if you've been com commissioned or not, I can tell you for sure you have not been. When you get commissioned by God, you will know it. I'm just saying, bless your heart. <laughs> but Jesus constantly challenged them, called them hypocrites. I mean, he stood up to them. He didn't give him one bit. He did things it seems like to me to very purposely offend them. <laughs> I like that. <clears throat> but I think one of the examples of someone, there's a lot in here about other roots of the religious spirit. But uh, one of the great examples in scripture, by the way, we need to get go back and really study the Jezebel, Ahab, that old scenario. We're replaying that. We're replaying the, what happened before the days of Noah because we're entering days like the days of Noah again. All that we really need to understand. We can get clarity on the, these things. But uh, uh, one of the biggest, to me, obvious foundations for religious spirit is guilt. Now, you remember... Eli, who was the high priest. And remember the first prophetic word given to Samuel was for the high priest, and it was not a good word. I just submit to you, I think a huge number of the prophetic words being spread as prophetic words in our time are not coming from God. They are under the category of what would be called flattery. Look up the scriptures on flattery and see what God thinks of flattery. I'm just saying, bless your hearts. Remember Eli, he was the high priest. Listen, he was zealous for the Lord. But what was the first word Samuel's given for the high priest in Israel? For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. End of word. How would you like to get that? How would you like for that to be your first prophetic word to give to someone? Who's the leader of your nation? Who's whatever, a high leader of the church? How would you like that? <laughs> Just, I think one thing here we need to understand, nowhere does the Lord say in this, he could not forgive Eli. What he's saying is all of your zeal, all of your sacrifices, all of your offerings will never make atonement for your sin of not disciplining your own children. 
It's, that's not going to do it. But he didn't say he couldn't find forgiveness. He just said, your sacrifices will never atone for that. And I tell you, many people's zeal for the Lord is an attempt to atone for their own shortcomings in other places. And that's an affront to the cross. The only way these things can be atoned for. Now, many other things about this, if you want to follow this, but you see also that Eli's sons despise the offering of the Lord. So Eli let them do that. He's the high priest. He's the one who's over that. And I tell you, the misuse of... Uh, I know many people who live a life of the cross, of self-sacrifice. But they are putting their trust in their cross instead of the cross of Christ. We take up our crosses daily. It's our cross. But it must never eclipse the cross of Christ. We do it out of love for him, but we don't base our you know, position with God or our approval with God on what we do. We do. It's on what he did. So how do we balance these? We do. You will as you mature. Let me just finish. There's so much more to cover on this, but I'm just shot, I just shotgunned you, and you got to figure out the rest. But it's an open book test. You got the same book I got all this from. <laughs> Philippians 1.9. This I pray, that your love may abound more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Most of what is being called discernment today is rooted in religious spirit and it is suspicion, not discernment. Discernment, true discernment can only come from love, through love. If you have a dream of some evil about somebody that wounded you or something, I guarantee you that that came from the devil, not the Lord. I don't ever receive a negative, you know, sense, negative impression, negative prophetic revelation of any kind against somebody that I might have something against. I don't receive those. Uh, and until you love the person... I don't think you're going to get stuff accurate. But if you've got bitterness in your heart, you've got a wide open gate of hell for the enemy to come in any way he wants to. What was the first test that Israel had to pass to get through the wilderness? After they got into the wilderness. Remember the waters of Marah, the waters of bitterness? They were poisoned after three days without water. Have you ever gone a full day without water? Liquids? You think fasting is hard? Think of that whole two million people. Probably. No water for three days in a desert. They were on the edge of death. Then they get to water and it's poison. You can understand. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't have all the history we had. You can understand why they would think Jehovah's just, he's really powerful. We know his power, but he is really, he's brought us out here to just make sport of us and kill us. They didn't know he was good. But I tell you, if we're going to get through the wilderness, we're all going through right now to get to the promised land, to walk in the promises of God. First thing we got to get is how to turn the bitter waters into sweet. How did he do that? How did Moses do it? He threw a tree in the water and they became sweet. That tree always represents the cross. Scripture. We've got to go to the cross. We have to totally forgive everyone for everything. Nothing happened to you that didn't happen so that the Lord, except the Lord want to use it to give you more authority. He, Lord may not have done it to you, but he allowed it to happen to give you more authority. Because we receive our authority the same way Jesus did. 
By his stripes we are healed. He received authority to heal us by his stripes. What he unjustly suffered. And every time you unjustly suffer, you can receive authority from above to heal the same things. If you've been abused, you can have received the authority for healing other people been through abuse. Everything. So we've got to see these as op the opportunities that they are and give thanks for everything. He's wanting to trust us with more authority. And then what was the next thing, next scripture there say? If we would obey his commandments and heed his voice, and almost every time in the Old Testament, those two go together. Even under the Old Covenant, they were required to know his voice and obey his voice. My people, my sheep know my voice. Every time. But he said, if you will obey my commandments and heed my voice, I will not put on you the diseases that are put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. I believe almost all of the afflictions, physical afflictions we're going through, somehow it's rooted in unforgiveness. Not going to the cross. Bitterness that we've not been delivered of. I'm just saying, we've got to learn to take up the cross and to do it the right way. And to worship the one who went to the cross that really counts, not to start worshiping our own crosses, our own sacrifices and things like that. Keep our attention on him and be changed by his glory as we follow him to do the same things.